In studying any book of the Bible, or any character written in the Bible, it's helpful for us to understand as much information about their background as we possibly can get. That's not always possible because usually the writer of the book is not the main issue, and many of the characters who are portrayed in the Bible we know nothing about their early childhood or where they were born. But not so in the case of the Apostle Paul. Here we have a great deal of information which is gleaned not only from the book of Acts, the historical recording of his life and journeys, but we also have it in his own testimony, which was given before the Jews and before the Romans, as well as information that comes from his epistles. With the Apostle Paul, we can ask the question, who was he, where did he come from, and we can get an answer. Paul gave this testimony himself. He said, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. Cilicia was on the crossroads of the empire. It is in what is modern-day Turkey. From this place, the caravans and the merchandise that traveled overland between Europe and Asia would have to pass through the city of Tarsus. So that made it a very important city indeed. This is the place where Saul of Tarsus was born. You see, the Apostle Paul was not always known by the name Paul. He would only began using that name as he began his first missionary journey. Until then, he used his Jewish name, Saul, which is short for Solomon. He was named after that great king. Tarsus was also a center of tent making, and it is in this trade that Paul was trained. Turn with me to Acts chapter 18 and verse 3. Here we find that the Apostle Paul has moved on from Athens into Corinth. And in Corinth, he comes across two disciples of the Lord, one named Priscilla, the other Aquila, a married couple who had just been kicked out of Rome by decree. And it says in verse 3, And because he was of the same craft, meaning Paul, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Saul was trained as a youth in making of tents. And that served him well all through his missionary journeys because he was able to support himself and those who traveled with him. Now we don't know whether his father was a tent maker. It may have been that he was a seller of tents because we can see from other information that he must have been a very wealthy man. He was probably engaged in the trade in some way and so he had his son to learn the trade of tent making. Another thing we know about the Apostle Paul is that he was a Roman citizen. Turn again with me to Acts chapter 22 and verses 25 through 26. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Well, how is it that Paul received his Roman citizenship? To understand the answer to that question, we have to go back into the history of Tarsus. In the year 66 BC, Rome granted all of its inhabitants citizenship in the empire, but it didn't last. In the year 14 BC, they removed this privilege from all but three classes of people, those who were wealthy, those who had political influence, and those who had rendered particular service to the Roman Empire. That particular service is referring to those who had served many years in the military. And as a privilege, as a reward for their service, they were granted citizenship and allowed to settle in one of its colonies. This could not be referring to Saul's father. Saul's father was a Pharisee. He was a Jew and he was a nationalist. He could not serve in the Roman Empire's army. So what other possibility? You think perhaps Saul's father had political influence? Again, very unlikely. There's only one possibility that makes any sense. That is that Saul's father must have been a wealthy man. He had paid a price to keep his citizenship. And because of that, 
Saul was also a Roman citizen. Another thing we know about Paul is that he identified himself as being a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Look with me to the 23rd chapter of Acts and verse 6. In this instance, Paul has been arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Paul here identifies himself as a Pharisee. This had been his religious conviction since childhood. It had been passed down to him from his father. And so he had striven for many years to be as good a Pharisee as possible. Well, what does that mean? Who were the Pharisees? These were the legalists of Jesus' time. These were the legalists of Paul's time. The word for Pharisee actually comes from a Hebrew word, Hasidim, which means the separated ones. Today we have the Hasidic Jews, which are also considered the separated ones, the conservatives of religious Judaism today. So Paul identifies himself as a Pharisee, this group that had been established back in 165 BC during the Maccabean Revolt. But its history had gone all the way back to the Babylonian captivity. And as a Pharisee had received the best training, he sat at the feet of Rabbi Gamaliel in the Mishnah, one of the great writings of the Jewish religion. We read, Since Rabbi Gamaliel the Elder died, there has been no more reverence, for the law and purity and piety died out at the same time. This was Gamaliel, the greatest teacher of Paul's time. And as a young man, Saul had the privilege of sitting at his feet and learning from the master. But what did he learn? What did the Pharisees believe? Well, they believed in righteousness through the following of every minute detail of the law. They also believed in the priesthood through piety and not through birthright. They believed in the spiritual realm, including angels. And they believed in the resurrection of the dead and of judgment. Paul, understanding all the beliefs of the Pharisees, was able to use this against them and the Sadducees. When they had brought him in for judgment before the Sanhedrin, he said, It's for the resurrection of the dead that I am here being judged. Look with me at chapter 23 and verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. You see, Paul understood the beliefs of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, so when he's brought before the Sanhedrin, he is able to use their own craftiness against them, a fact that Jesus had well established in the past. Saul was undeniably zealous. He followed after the things that he had been taught. Look at Galatians chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14 with me. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. When we look into the beliefs of the Pharisees, we find four areas of extremism that dominated their lives. The first was puritanical extremism. They had an aversion to anyone or anything that they deemed to be unclean. You remember how they reacted to Jesus when Jesus would meet with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and eat meals with them. The Pharisees thought this was a defiling act. But Jesus pointed out their hypocrisy in Matthew chapter 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. The second kind of extremism was that of extreme nationalism. The Pharisees, after all, were Jews, part of God's chosen people, the children of the promise through Abraham. Everyone else, therefore, the Gentiles, whether they be Greek, or whether they be Romans, or even the Samaritans who were intermarried Jews with Gentiles, 
they were all inferior to the Jews in the minds of the Pharisees. Let's see how John the Baptist dealt with this issue when the Pharisees came out to watch him baptize. Turn to Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Wow. Could you imagine being there to hear those words coming from John the Baptist's mouth? Especially if you were a Pharisee, being called a snake, a viper, or from Jesus, being called a hypocrite to your face. Well, if the shoe fits, wear it. And if the name fits, accept it. But the Pharisees could never accept that of themselves. There was a third kind of extremism that fit into the Pharisaic life. Extreme legalism. They were legalistic to every minor detail of the law, but they missed the big principles. They missed the big picture. Let's look at what Jesus said, Matthew 23 and verse 23, as he addresses this issue. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. What Jesus is talking about here when he mentions that they would pay a tithe out of the mint and the anise and the cumin is that a Pharisee would go to the market and purchase a small amount of an herb or a spice, take it to his home, and literally separate exactly 10% of that out so that he could give it to the temple, thus fulfilling his obligation to the tithe. And yet, they would miss the big principle. They would miss the more important issues like judgment and mercy and faith. Now, which is more important, judgment, mercy, and faith, or the number of seeds that are given to the temple? In the thinking of the Pharisee, the most important issue was the number of seeds. There's a fourth kind of extremism that characterizes Pharisees, and that is extreme hypocrisy. Demanding of others what you yourself will not do. Well, let's look at what Jesus said about that in Matthew 23, verses 2 through 4. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Jesus taught his disciples that it was more important to serve than to be served. That a true leader was one who was a servant of all. But this was not in the belief of the Pharisees. They wanted the glory for themselves, the honor for themselves. They didn't want so much to serve as to be served. Of course, it would be unfair to judge every Jewish leader as being this kind of a hypocrite. There were some who sincerely wanted to do right and sought after truth. One such person was Nicodemus, who came to Jesus in the middle of the night seeking wisdom. And then there was Joseph of Arimathea, who may have been a secret disciple of Jesus. He's the one who took the body of Christ down from the cross and placed the body into his own personal tomb. However, Paul did identify himself as being this kind of a hypocrite. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he says of himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. There is a fifth kind of extremism that identifies a Pharisee. That is extreme hatred. The Pharisees hated Jesus Christ. They hated what he represented. They sought to trip him up in his words. They sought to get him in trouble with Rome. And finally, they sought to take his life. This extreme hatred also identifies Saul. Saul hated the name of Jesus Christ. He was there at the persecution and martyrdom of St. Stephen. 
He was there giving consent to his death, holding the coats of those men who would pick up the stones and hurl them and take Stephen's physical life. And you would think that that would be enough, but it's never enough, because violence begets violence and hatred begets hatred. He continued to persecute the church in Jerusalem. He arrested many men and women and took them before the Sanhedrin for judgment. And many others of the Christian faith fled the city and went to other places. So Saul went to the chief priests and asked for letters so that he could pursue them, go to Damascus, have them arrested, and dragged back to Jerusalem. This is hatred for the name of Jesus Christ. He didn't realize that at the time, as we just mentioned, he did so ignorantly in unbelief. But later he realized, oh, the shame that he had put upon the name of Jesus, the hatred that he had shown even towards his own God. Paul described himself in this way, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Such hatred. Such violence. And yet... God saw something in this young man. He saw an Apostle Paul, not just the Saul of Tarsus. He saw the author of many of the books of the New Testament, not just a Pharisee. He saw a diamond in the rough, not just a lump of coal. You know, that's how diamonds are formed. You take a lump of coal and you put it under enough pressure for a long enough period of time and it will become a diamond. Is there someone in your life, someone that you can never imagine in a million years would become a Christian? Maybe they persecute the church. Maybe they hate religion. Maybe they hate the name of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. You start praying for that person. You ask God for an opportunity to share the gospel with them. It might astonish you what will happen. You know why? Because there is no one beyond the touch of God's grace. Saul of Tarsus is proof of that. Thank you so much for joining me in this first lesson on the Apostle Paul. If you have a Bible study leader, continue this lesson through discussion. And join us again as we go on to the second lesson on the Apostle Paul. God bless.